All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to day six of Organo Pilots. Reminder that your Wikipedia topic selection is due today. Thanks for those who've already sent an email about that. And the point of having the deadline for the topic selection early is so that if required, we can iterate and discuss and focus your topic selection, not to be early just for the sake of, of being early. So if if you're, if you're struggling to pick a topic, you're not sure you want to run ideas past us, that's totally okay. It doesn't have to be finalized at the time you send the email. It, it can be, we can discuss, and if you have a couple ideas in mind, I, we I'm, can help you narrow that down. So please take advantage of that. <laughs> So today we will more or less finish discussion of the elementary reactions, elementary steps that organometallic complexes can go on. As a reminder, we're building up essentially our alphabet here that we're going to then put together in composition when we start talking about catalytic cycles. We won't totally get through all the elementary steps, so there'll be a little bit of bleed over to next week into the carbene and metal um, <clears throat> carbon multiple bond section, which is which is okay. Uh, there's no reason to rush just for the sake of rushing. Uh, but last time we left off with a discussion of oxidative addition. And just as a reminder, we talked about the three canonical uh, oxidative addition mechanisms, concerted, um, nucleophilic, and radical. And we'll pet if, if that um, was a little fast for you. We'll have plenty of time today to uh, review those uh, those mechanisms through through examples. And before jumping in to wrap up the problems of the day from last time, I want to introduce one related elementary reaction. It doesn't really fit in anywhere perfectly, but I think it fits in here as well as anywhere. And that's a process called oxidative cyclometallation. You can see the relationship here between this process and oxidative addition, because like oxidative addition, you have an increase in the metal oxidation state from N to N plus two. The difference here is that you form two metal carbon bonds simultaneously in, a, in the form of a cyclic uh, metalla, uh, in the form of a metallocyclic structure. So specifically, the definition here is a process in which uh, two pi systems, and this is typically carbon carbon, but can also be carbon heteroatom if you're thinking about imines or, or carbonyl compounds. Uh, two distinct pi systems uh, that, that can be intermolecularly disposed or intramolecularly disposed react across a metal, forming two new uh, sigma bonds between the organic fragment and, and the metal. And then, as I said, increasing the oxidation state by two. So, overall, this forms uh, three sigma bonds because you also have formation of a sigma bond between the two um, organic substituents. So these three sigma bonds here. And if this process looks somewhat familiar, that's likely because you've encountered it in catalytic processes like alkyne or alkene trimerization, the paulsen kahn reaction, many venerable reactions rely on this oxidative cyclometallation step. Okay, so that, wraps up more or less the uh, notes for day five. I want to jump back now to the problems of the day from day five. Uh, we'll just do two and three here, back to back. <clears throat> so problem two asks you to consider pairs of related organometallic complexes that are undergoing uh, oxidative addition and asks you to predict which of the two has a faster rate. So that will be rapid fire. So take a minute to think about that. Discuss with your neighbor and then we'll go through that as a class. And if you want to take a sneak peek ahead, the next problem of the day that we'll do will be an open-ended discussion. It asks you to consider 
this CSP3, CSP2 cross coupling published by the lab of Greg Fu that proceeds under nickel catalysis with BIPI as a ligand. And the overall catalytic cycle here, the order of steps is not critical at this stage. We know, as we'll see in the cross coupling lecture, cross coupling takes place by some sequence of translation, oxidative addition, rectal elimination in some order. We're just zooming in on the oxidative addition step that involves the CSP3 organic halide in this case, and asking to think about the mechanism, how to, what possible mechanisms it might be proceeding through, and then how you would design mechanistic experiments to determine the mechanism of that oxidative addition step. So if you want to take a peek ahead uh, after you're done with problem day number two, then, then uh, by all means, please discuss, uh, think about that and discuss with your neighbor. I have these problems restated or redrawn on my iPad, so I'll switch over now. Okay, how about part A, Shenghua, what do you think about this one? Uh, iridium should uh, react faster. And why do you think so? Uh, for electron H. That was an Why? Iridium is. Iridium Y is D, 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 D10, right? Iridium one should be D what? Square planar D. Oh, D8. D8. Okay. 
but ro ro rhodium well the uh it's also da also da yeah so you have found the crux of the problem so yeah. so so actually rhodium should read faster why do you think so because the iridium is um more electron active. This is on the right, right side of the periodic table. Mm -hmm. So how are iridium and rhodium related on the periodic table? Maybe Juntao is he's trying to signal something to you. Mm -hmm. So maybe he can you know, uh, nice chime in. Iridium is a third row, so it's more electron rich. Okay. Yeah, it's faster. more nucleophilic is another way to state that. And we also know that it will form a stronger metal carbon bond. Now that's a thermodynamic argument, but that also in this case means that there's a more stable transition state in that bond forming event. Any questions on that? Okay, number two, or sorry, part B of, of this question. about Hannah. Let's first draw out the structure of DBA. I don't know if you have encountered that before, Hannah. You know the structure? Five benzyl. I got it. Perfect, dibenzylidine acetone. So now we're comparing DBA versus BINAP in this oxidative addition step. We, we can appreciate right off the bat that the two ligands we're comparing are not in the final product. So that means they have to do something, uh, namely go away at some point during this, this process. So which of those two do you think um, would be more likely to react faster? Is it indirect way say which reacts faster? DBA. Okay, why? Less bulky. Okay. Less bulky. And what other differences? Okay. Less bulky would be a steric argument. Both the electronics are different. So the INAP binds with loss pairs. Okay, and so you, I think you're on the right track here. So phosphorus, phosphine ligands, we think of as quite strong sigma donors. Alkenes, what property do they have? They are sigma donors, but their dominant property is with an electron rich low valent metal center would be what? So pi acceptor. Donation of the filled orbital on the metal to the pi star antibonding orbital of the ligand. Perfect. So now, based on that, do you stick with your original argument of DBA? No? Yes? What do you think? Tr trust your gut, Hannah. Okay, stick with the original answer, DBA. There are competing factors here. If you might go along to, to one of two trains of thought. One is you could say, okay, BINAP is um, a stronger sigma donor. Um, it is potentially a little bit more uh, rigid depending on how DBA is drawn. We don't have that uh, bound. We don't have that specified here. Um, but I think the thing, the key thing to appreciate here is that it's the starting material is palladium zero. So it's electron rich. And so it's going to form a stronger interaction. Uh, 
with uh, uh, a pi accepting ligand. And then as Hannah said, you have, you're comparing a bulky ligand that uh, is experiencing a lot of steric clashing and, and keen to, to get off um, versus a small ligand that is electrons accepting. So I think, uh, what was it, well, what reacts faster? Oh, so I think it's, I think the reasoning you gave is, is spot on, Hannah, but, and that will, will lead us to uh, by now. I think you said TPA, but the reasoning was just for by now. I might have confused you in my, my question, so sorry if I did that. Questions on that one? Okay, and last one, Christine, how about uh, take a shot at this one? So first and, and foremost, let's let's do this part together. What do we think the light is doing here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, those are end up being um, equivalent. Well, they're enantiomers of each other, but but it's a it's a racemate. So. Either way is, is, is fine. I actually drew it the other way, but then I thought it was confusing because you have a dashed bond and it, it looks a little more confusing. Okay, so first, Christine, what's the light gonna do here? It's gonna go to the right. Okay. What else could light be doing? We learned that when you irradiate kinetically stable organometallic complexes, it can trigger something. What do we think? How do we feel in general about this di iridium three dihydride? What do we think that that might want to do? Any assist from the audience? We're mouthing it. Who's hydrogen? Who's hydrogen? Okay. And the light will, will help that process take place. It's related to that process we talked about ligand or uh, photo dissociation. In this case, it's a photo induced reductive elimination. Now we have two, two open coordination sites. This looks now quite, quite reactive. And so we see that the process that is, the overall process here is now a CH, um, CH insertion. So we start with iridium three, we're down now because it was a reductive elimination to iridium one. So this will serve as a natural segue to our next topic. And then the product we see is back to iridium three. So that was a CH oxidative addition that took place then across metal. And are there any predictions? Christine, what did you predict would be the faster reacting? This one is a little tricky, so just go with your instinct and then we can discuss yeah, the same or different. That, that faster one would be more potent than the other. The ethyl would be more bulky, okay? So you would go with the R equals H. Okay, did anybody get anything different?
Sure, I think if that if it was a radical process, then that would be reasonable. But it, um, let's say let's let's orient our thinking as closed shell process. And definitely, okay. Anybody get thinking closed shell? Get the opposite answer. So the R equals H is correct here. So ethane reacts faster in this case than does. What is the other one? Butane. Um, and I think sterics is one reasonable explanation along those lines. If you if you actually draw out these structures, you'll note that ethane, every CH bond on ethane is capable of reacting. The internal positions on butane are not capable of reacting. So from a statistical argument, you are going to end up populating many non-productive forms of the corresponding sigma complex in the case of butane versus ethane. Very good. Any questions on any of those three? Wait, could you yes. reiterate why the like methylenes are basically incapable of undergoing CH insertion? Yeah, we'll we'll cover that in a little bit more detail in the CH activation lecture, but I'll just give you a quick preview of that, is that this mode of CH activation, which is an inner sphere closed shell process, uh, where it's a CH oxidative addition, so let me just write that out, CH ox addition, is very sterically sensitive, so it prefers primary CH bonds to secondary to tertiary. Madison was talking about another paradigm of radical based CH abstraction that has a different selectivity profile. But this particular paradigm, closed shell, inserted CH oxidative addition prefers primary CH bonds. Okay. Very um, sensitive to sterics. Uh, and this will make sense when we look at the MO, MO deficit there. Okay, super. Let's then jump ahead to the next problem of the day. Considering now possible mechanisms for this oxidative addition process in this nickel cross coupling. Let's just do this as a as an all class class-wide discussion brainstorm. So first, let's consider the possible mechanisms and that just falls directly out of the discussion from, from last time. So you have a concerted pathway, a nucleophilic SN2 type pathway and a radical pathway. And then we've talked about briefly about experiments to disambiguate among them, but let's drill down a little bit more now into specifics for this reaction system, what type of experiments you might, you might use. Yeah, let's, so let's, let's go for it, Alex. What do you think? For <clears throat> solvent effects to distinguish between uh, nucleophilic versus radical slash uh, concerted. Okay, so what, what would you, so, I mean, if it's a polar transition state via nucleophilic, you'd expect increased rate and in under a more stabilizing solvents, some more polar solvents. Okay. And it would be difficult to distinguish between radical and uh, concerted based on that experiment. But based on the substrate, I would say it's probably not concerted given the polarity of the bond. <clears throat> I would also, are we talking about experiments to try? We could also do a radical trap to see if there's a, a chain mechanism occurring. What's a radical trap? Give me an example. Uh, something like tempo, perhaps. Okay. So what would you expect to happen if you add tempo? Well, if you expect a mechanism, you get the tempo addict on cyclohexane, mm -hmm. perhaps. Did 
to you said it was from a radical chain. Well, if it was a chain mechanism, this might be able to trap, depending on the kinetics of trapping versus recombination. Um, yeah, in principle, this is a good idea. I think one of the complications of these types of radical trap experiments, you can use tempo. Another common one is DHT, which traps radicals a little bit more slowly. So it gets butylated, and it gets structurally butylated, hydroxy toluene. A complicating factor is that sometimes these trapping reagents can directly modify the oxidation state of the metal and throw it off cycle without really probing exactly what you want. That's why I, the point that you made um, of looking specifically for this O cyclohexyl adduct is an important, important one. So if you see it shut down the chemistry and you see this adduct form, then uh, that, that is indeed informative. Likewise, I think the solvent effect proposal is, is, a, is a good one, but it, it does, there, there are a couple caveats to this. One is that you, need, you would need the oxidative addition to be the turnover limiting step so that you're actually reading out the right step and not a different step. That we don't know from the information provided. And then the other is that you need a sufficient range of solvents to be compatible with the reaction to perform the experiment. Sometimes that's true, sometimes not, but in principle, it's a good, good suggestion. What else do we have? PCR, we're thinking radical. Um, try to monitor the electron spin on nickel, and then I'm not sure if you can actually see the carbon radical on PCR. Yeah, so if the resting state of the catalyst has an unpaired spin, and we have a standard that is similar enough that we've seen before in the literature to make an assignment from the EPR spectrum, then I think it's useful potential. What, what else do we have here? You can maybe throw a cyclopropane on your starting material. Aha, okay. Slightly different than a radical trap. This is called what? The radical clock. The radical clock, okay. And the one, the variant you were talking about would be, let's just, let's draw out what would be the simplest one to do first. I know, I realize our starting material here is secondary, but for synthetic simplicity's sake, let's just do the primary. So in this case, if we generate this radical, then it will open, do you know, the first order rate constant, at least the order of magnitude of this? Anybody? 11? It, oh, that's with phenyl. It's, it's fast. It's, yeah, you're in the right ballpark with with phenyl with uh unsubstituted we're we're at 10 to the seventh or in fact 10 to the eighth per second so in the context of our reaction here then we would maybe expect to see, see what the arrow bring open product here. Do I have the right number of carbons? One, two, three, four, one, two, three. I lost one here. Okay, very good. And what other radical clocks, type of radical clock do people, have, have you seen before or could you en envision you? One is ring opening and the other was mix making signs here, the corresponding ring closing variant, right? So in this case, similar design. The 
potentially you might need a header atom linker to, to get a ability. This can then undergo five exo, five exo dig cyclization. That whole cycle is continual radical in the context of a catalytic reaction. The rate constant here is you don't necessarily need to remember all these numbers, although it is it is useful, is on the order of, of 10 to the five. So two orders of magnitude slower. And it's useful to to remember the ballpark here, because one of the things you learn if you work in radical chemistry or at the interface of radical chemistry and organotelic chemistry is that the nice feature of these radical clocks is that they span several different orders of magnitude in terms of the rate constant. So you can actually do a, a panel of these and pin down the rate of the potential radical cycle. So you can see how long lived the, the, the radical is and whether it's escaping solvent gauge, this sort of question. Super. Is that supposed to be five X on trig? What did I say? I said trig and I wrote dig. Okay, any other experiments here? Aha, okay, how are you going to do this? Beautiful, okay. So we are going to use an enantio enriched alkyl bromide here. Then you're gonna we're gonna ask is it stereo invertive? Is it stereo retentive? So potentially this is gonna be a nail in the coffin experiment. Mm -hmm. perfect kind of mechanistic experiment you want where you can in a single shot well-designed experiment disambiguate among all three of your competing mechanistic hypotheses but what is the challenge with this and then further how to make all of the standards you need So I think the community appreciates this as a challenge. And so it turns out you can get a lot of the same information without the burden of synthetic difficulty by looking at these pairs of substrates, more boronal substrates with bromide up, or bromide down. And if they react via a radical pathway, then it should be a common radical. They will intercept the same intermediate. And so if you run those two experiments and they both converge to the same product, and that is not what you'd expect from either of the closed shell pathways. And you can infer that there was a common intermediate, then you can infer that intermediate was radical. So this is an, sometimes these diastereomeric pairs can give you the same information as an enantio 
pure starting material, but without the difficulty of synthesis. Very good. Any questions on that discussion? I, are there ideas people have that we can discuss? I have a general question. Yeah. So, to, to what extent is the nature of the, I guess, metal radical carbon bond matter here? Because there's obviously a rate of dissociation between the metal and the carbon radical. There's all the case. So, how do you, in a, in a systematic May understand whether your radical clock is happening versus not happening because of rates versus there's actually a radical involved. Does that make sense? Like, because you're, right. let's say your radical region. You have a radical process, but yeah. a, a extremely, exceedingly fast recombination, then a lot of the techniques that you might use will miss it. Right? So I think the, that's why it's good to come at it from several, using several complementary techniques and see if all of these techniques are pointing in the same direction. I think technically, if you use a radical clock experiment, I think if and you read the literature, people will interpret these a little bit too um, aggressively or too generously. They'll say, we ran this radical clock experiment, therefore it rules in, or let's say there was no ring opening of this cyclopropyl methyl substrate, therefore there is not a radical involved. The strict interpretation of that is, Therefore, two possibilities now are on the table. One is there's no radical involved. The other is that a radical is generated, but the rate of recombination is faster than the second, the, the second order rate constant for recombination um, is such that it is the overall rate ends up being faster than you know, roughly 10 to the 10 to the seven per second. Uh, so sometimes in the literature, people are a little bit careless with that interpretation. Um, But I think that's part of the virtue of using these faster and faster clocks. You said there are some, as you pointed out, there are some that can go up to you know, 10 to the 10th, 10 to the 11th, and then you're essentially a diffusion. Yeah, great, great question, uh, Alex. Okay, let's go ahead and jump over then to our Next set of notes. We'll get through, get as far as we can here. So we've talked about oxidative addition, and now we're going to talk about its microscopic reverse process, reductive elimination. And because these are microscopic reverses of each other, I'll go through this part fairly quickly, because most of the trends that you see that we've encountered for oxidative addition are going to now be the opposite in reductive elimination. So opposite to oxidative addition, now in a reductive elimination, uh, you're spitting out an organic fragment and uh, gaining two electrons from those, the two ligands that used to be bound. Thus, the coordination number is decreasing by two. The oxidation state is decreasing by two because of those two gained electrons. And the total electron count is decreasing by two. The D electron count, as we'll see through examples, uh, increases by two, again, because you have two electrons that were ligand-based that are now metal-based. There's a stereo uh, chemical requirement here that in a concerted pathway, that the, that the groups involved be cisoid to one another. And so sometimes you'll see, I, I remember when I was a student, you'd see these exam questions where you'd be thinking, about ligand effects, and bite angle, and all these complicating factors. And in point of fact, the groups that are being asked about for their, this reductive elimination step, they're just not in the appropriate stereochemistry to, to react. So it's a kind of like a trick, a trick question to watch out for. So they need to be in the cisoid relationship, which is the one drawn here. Again, that follows just from what we covered in oxidative addition where in a concerted oxidative addition, the two new groups are initially introduced trans, they might undergo geometric reorganization later, but they're, in, sorry, they're introduced cis, they might later undergo um, geometric reorganization. So let's talk now about, in terms of the overall coordination environment, the oxidation state um, of the metal, the, the, the properties of the complex, what factors promote reductive elimination? So one is, um, 
of paucity of electron density on the metal. And the simplest manifestation of that is a high oxidation state. So in the literature, um, let's say in the past 15 years, uh, there's been a lot of progress in carbon fluorine reductive elimination, a traditionally difficult process at, at a palladium center, certainly at a palladium two center. One of the, the tricks that was used was to go to a higher oxidation state of palladium, palladium three or palladium four to drive this otherwise kinetically uh, difficult reductive elimination step. We saw in oxidative addition that electron donating sterically small ligands promote oxidative addition. The exact opposite is the case here. Reductive elimination is promoted by bulky ligands through a process that we call squeezing out. And then in the case, and, and, and so one way, we'll talk about this in the ligand design lecture, that we parameterize steric bulk is something called cone angle. There are others such as berry volume. And then in a bidentate structure, um, a, a wider bite angle, bite angle here just means that the angle at which the two coordinating groups are splayed, a wider bite angle has a higher squeezing out effect. One point I, I want to highlight here is that um, if we're talking about now the groups that are undergoing reductive elimination, it tends to be more favorable, which I think is intuitive if you, if you think about this from first principles. Uh, it tends to be more favorable when those ligands that are being squeezed out have higher S character, have a higher spherical, have more spherical orbits. Why is that? Well, if you think like my, aren't my hands are the ligands and my chest is a metal and I have like two beach balls attached to my hands, then I can bring those together very easily. But if I have two pool noodles, two orbitals with P character, then it's very hard for me to bring the ends of those pool noodles, or the mills of those pool noodles together. Um, and I saw at least one, somebody had a smile on their face. So that's, that's all I hope for as, a, as an instructor with these analogies. So aryl and alkenal tend to be easier than alkyl. And that is part, not the only reason, but part of why historically sp3 based cross couplings have been more challenging than sp2 based cross couplings. So the first generation of cross couplings to come online were aryl, 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 alkenal, alkenal, alkenal. Now, uh, through engaging alternative mechanistic paradigms, now we see sp3 partners being engaged. The actual bond forming event, um, it can, can vary quite a bit in terms of its overall electronic distribution. In practice, um, though, though there are cases like in a dihydrogen reductive elimination we saw in the, in the previous problem uh, or reductive elimination of, of biphenyl or, meth, or ethane where the two groups being reductive eliminated are are equivalent and thus the transition state is symmetrical. Um, and in most cases, the two different groups are, are inequivalent and thus one ends up acting more or less as the nucleophile and one ends up acting more or less as the electrophile. And so in considering mechanistic experiments, it's an important caveat to think if you have a series of complexes and when you're studying an aryl X reductive elimination, then whether that aryl group is electron rich or electron poor, whether you expect it to go faster or slower is depending on whether it's functioning you know, as the quasi nucleophile or the quasi electrophile. Uh, and, and that's not in, always intrinsically obvious from the, from the reaction conditions alone. Sorry, I realized I wasn't totally zoomed in there. And so a point here, I should complete this, this thought. Is uh, reductive elimination is, is a little bit complicated in the sense that there are, are a couple different flavors of reductive elimination. There's what we would call a non dissociative pathway where if you have an octahedral metal, it was directly going reductive elimination, undergoing reductive elimination from the six coordinate state. 
or if you have a square planar complex, it's directly undergoing reclination from that four coordinate state. But empirically, it's been found that oxidative addition, uh, is the lowest barrier for uh, reductive elimination is often from an odd coordination number of species. So if you have a four coordinate D8 metal center, it would prefer to undergo reductive elimination from a three coordinate state or a five coordinate state through dissociation of a ligand or association of a ligand, respectively, than directly undergoing reclamation. All three are possible in principle, but in, in practice, the two odd electron, uh, the two um, odd coordination number forms are preferred. In a six coordinate structure, reductive elimination often is preferred, refers losing a ligand to get to a five coordinate structure and then undergoing reclamation. Why is that? Um, we'll talk about that, but it has to do with the fact that in a, let's say a five coordinate state, you're at a trigonal bipyramidal uh, geometry. In a three coordinate state, you're at a trigonal geometry. So, so the key point is that in a trigonal bipyramidal geometry along the equator, it's also trigonal. And these trigonal geometries um, are very hot to trot for reductive elimination. Um, because they end up adopting this, this so-called Y-shaped form, where the two groups undergoing reductive elimination end up being in very close proximity to one, one another. And that's due to D electrons and the or, um, orbital splitting. So specifically, if you have a perfectly trigonal geometry, an equilateral triangle, that is not favorable from a D orbital perspective. And actually through the phenomenon we talked about called Young Teller distortion, instead break symmetry to go Y-shaped or go T-shaped. And the Y-shaped form especially is very Prime for reclamation. Uh, that is, is that's starting to get a little bit deep in the weeds. So I just want to draw attention to this. Um, it's a computational paper from the 80s, but I think um, at times it's a little bit dense, but it provides a very nice analysis of reductive elimination from different possible coordination junk. I think for the purposes of the class, the key thing to remember is that um, association or dissociation of a ligand often can precede reductive elimination. A point just to circle back to this point I made earlier is that C heteroatom reductive elimination, particularly with nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, has historically been difficult. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that the now the one of the atoms involved in reductive elimination is highly electronegative, small and non-polarized. So remember that reductive elimination is all about orbital overlap. And when one of the uh, groups involved in reductive elimination does not have diffuse orbitals but holds the electrons very tightly, then it's hard to get productive over orbital overlap in the reductive elimination transition state. And then another competing factor comes back to this geometric argument that I made. As it turns out, very electron electronegative atoms prefer to be at the bottom part of the Y-shaped intermediate and I think that makes sense if you think about the overall electron flow from this, from this transition state. But that's exactly where you don't want it to be. So uh, it's then far apart from the action. And just as one example in the um, literature, let's say from the, the early 2000s, uh, uh, researchers were, would try to induce carbon fluorine reductive elimination from a palladium two center. And they would see instead carbon phosphorus reductive elimination from the supporting ligand to make a phosphonium product. Why? Because fluorine is way away from the, the action. You can't get any good orbital overlap. Okay, so now let's look at a, um, so I, I, I talked um, some of these notes reflect things I've already said. So in the octahedral form, um, you can have direct reductive elimination. You can also have an SN, uh, 
you know, non-dissociative pathway, you have a dissociative pathway, and you can have a um, SN2 type rectomination pathway that we won't uh, talk too much about in, in this class, but is in, in, in follows an analogy to what we talked about in the oxidative addition portion of the class. And then square planar um, is maybe the most complex because it can undergo these three flavors that, that we just we just talked about. Um, and then uh, uh, for in, in cases where the groups that need to be eliminated are, are trans to one another in, in the ground state, then there's a, a, a system trans isomerization process that needs to happen, which, which can have a high barrier and could actually preclude direct elimination from taking place. So let's consider to illustrate uh, some of these principles, just, just one, one case study from the 1980s. This is a, um, a really seminal report from um, and the first author, actually the only author is, is a now very famous organometallic chemist, David Milstein. Uh, this was from his time at, at DuPont, um, actually. And so uh, uh, Milstein was able to synthesize this stable uh, alkyl rhodium hydride. So let's quickly just do the, um, do our standard organometallic accounting here. Does anyone wanna help me with this? Wenji, what do you think? Six coordinate, that one's obvious. And then oxidation state is what? Okay, rhodium three, D what? D6 overall what? Okay, so through uh, detailed kinetic studies, Milstein found that uh, this reaction, um, among other experiments he did, he found that the rate of this overall process is suppressed by the addition of trimethyl phosphine. Is a ligand consistent with this mechanism? So the first step is loss of triphenyl phosphine. Now you get down to a four coordinate, five coordinate form. And you can do these, the electron inventory here at this point, it will depend on whether there's a solvent molecule there or it's truly vacant. But now you have the opportunity to slightly relax the geometry here from what was octahedral to now trigonal bipyramidal. In fact, it will be a distorted trigonal bipyramidal geometry that will adopt this Y-shaped form and bring the hydride ligand in close proximity to the alkyl ligand. Now your most electronegative group, the chloride, which happens to also be a weak sigma donor, is at the base of the Y-shaped geometry. That triggers reductive elimination to give a T-shaped form that then can reassociate the lost ligand to get to, let's do the, this one together, four coordinate, Rhodium one, D eight, any questions on that? Of time, but we can uh, we maybe kick this to a, I have this saved elsewhere, so that will kick that to a problem set. Okay, so let's uh, switch gears now to talk about um, insertion processes. So we've talked about um, these redox processes of um, oxidative addition or reductionation, and now we're going to discuss some processes that end up being uh, redox neutral, where uh, two ligands are undergoing uh, uh, bond forming or microscopic micro bond, bond breaking through um, these processes on the metal without uh, associated redox. So the first we'll talk about is 1-1 uh, migratory insertion, and then we'll talk about 1-2 migratory insertion, 
same principles um, at a 40,000 foot view, but the details are, are different. So they're important to unpack. So migratory insertion, if you want to think about um, pushing electrons here, essentially in aryl alkyl or H group, although as we'll see, H groups aren't um, good in this. Attacking the carbon atom of the associated of an associated carbonyl, freeing up a open coordination site. It's then trapped with the incoming leak. And this is an important point to not overlook that the initial migratory insertion step um, in many cases is, is endergonic so, and, and reversible and the, and the overall process is reversible. So without a trapping step, you do not have sufficient thermodynamic driving force to bring the process. So some of the features um, that I think are hopefully obvious from, from this general analysis, there's no change in oxidation state. Like some of the other processes we've seen, the two reacting ligands need to be cisoid to one another. We talked about the requirement for a trapping uh, ligand to avoid the reverse process. The, in most cases, this is proceeding via concerted mechanism. And thus, when the R group uh, has stereochemical information, that stereochemical information is, is retained. So, now let's talk about how to accelerate this elementary step. Uh, so it, when, when migratory insertion is more favorable for more electron poor metal centers, uh, bulky ligands, similar to the squeezing out effect that we saw in reductive elimination, will favor um, one, one migratory insertion. Because of the electron flow that I alluded to above, um, it turns out that one way to encourage migratory insertion is to further polarize the carbonyl group in analogy to additions to carbonyls or amines in organic chemistry through coordination of a Lewis acid um, or, or other strategies that you can, that you can think about. And so you see that in the case of Lewis acid, uh, substantial rate acceleration. Uh, going hand in hand with the fact that this process is accelerated at more electron poor metal centers, if you're able to get to higher oxidation state, for example, through single electron oxidation, that can be a, uh, a promoter for this process. And then uh, we have this general trend that 1 1 migratory insertion proceeds faster for 3D versus 4D versus 5D. And the question that I'll pose to you, and if anyone wants to volunteer a potential answer um, that would be appreciated is, is why would that be the case? So you're saying the metals are electron, more electron poor and now the reverse of the argument we just made and that feeds into to, to this first point. Okay. That is a contributing factor, but there's something else going on that's maybe even a more dominant factor. <coughs> so this has to do with the metal carbon bond strength.
So if you look at this overall process, you're going from something with in the generalized form above two metal carbon bonds, one of which is typically going to be aryl or alkyl, the R group, to something that has one carbon metal. So that means as you go 5D, 4D, 3D, the ground state, your starting point is going higher and higher energy. Then if you assume that the transition state energy stays more or less similar, then you'll have rate acceleration through ground state destabilization. The overall reactivity trends here, I will say, are complicated. And so I'll try to unpack this uh, best I can, but uh, the fact of the matter is that if you're looking at a, at a series, um, it's going to affect, it's going to, the relative rates are going to depend on all the things that you would expect, the metal, the ligand, the oxidation state of the metal, and the migrating group, um, et cetera. So let's now try to unpack this best we can. So let's introduce a concept called migratory aptitude, which is essentially a, um, if you're familiar with like one, two cationic rearrangements, a similar kind of principle, just a, a measure of how likely something is to migrate in, in this particular mechanistic paradigm of one, one migratory insertion. And so to, for, for this elementary step, we need to consider two, two factors, sort of a tier process. The first is just whether this overall migratory insertion process is thermodynamically allowed, thermodynamically favored or not. And in some cases, the answer is not. And then the process is not going to take place. So the cases in which it is thermodynamically unfavored are shown in this gray box. So those are metal hydrides, metal alkoxides, metal amidos, style ligands, can't, can't do this, but it's less common. So why is that? Let's consider, uh, as, as one representation, the metal hydrate. Metal H bonds are stronger than metal carbon bonds. So in this analysis I just presented of ground state de destabilization, so the metal H, you're in the worst possible starting point. So in practice, this ends up being thermodynamically hit, uh, uphill almost, almost all the time. So that's the first tier to consider. Now, the second tier is if it is thermodynamically allowed, then we need to dig into the kinetic factors. And the overall relative reactivities here generally track with Gen generally tracks with increasing um, increasing steric bulk and decreasing bonds. So it's a little bit counterintuitive. We just talked about how in the case of reductive elimination, high S character is helpful. Now we have essentially the opposite case where we have a fastest group being sterically hindered and SP3 hybridized. But that just goes to show that, that there's, some, there's a lot of subtlety here uh, in, in uh, in organometallic chemistry across different elementary steps. And it, I would just encourage you to think about in an extreme case, like a tributyl 1-1 migratory insertion, note that actually, unlike an reductive elimination, that is actually relieving a lot of steric encumbrance around the metal 
time. So it, it's hysterically bulky group, but the overall process ends up relieving hysteric encumbrance at the transition stage. Whereas in a reductive elimination, you get increasing hysteric encumbrance as you walk up towards the transition stage. So that's a, I think, a point I want to make there. Bless you. Okay, let's talk about the kinetics of this process. And I won't take a, a deep dive here, but I do want to show you enough so you have a general flavor here. And so in a canonical 1-1 um, insertion into a carbonyl ligand, we have two steps that we need to consider that end up being reflected in the overall rate loss. So the first is the migration, and then the second is the ligand trapping, just as we talked about before. And depending on the uh, rate constants involved here, you can be in several different mechanistic regimes. So let's, I've, I've done the math out ahead here, just so I don't screw it up when I'm doing it in live time. But if, if you're not clear on this, you can, you can do it yourself without looking at the notes and, and convince yourself that you'll get to the same thing. So the key step we need to consider um, in the initial rate expression is, uh, is, this, is this step going from intermediate I to product P. So we draw out that rate expression. And then we use the steady state approximation where we're saying the change in concentration of the intermediate is zero. So for, for um, every molecule of intermediate we make, we consume it at the same rate. So essentially the the, the, the rate of the first step is equivalent to the rate of the second step. And then we solve for the concentration of the intermediate, which is highlighted in green. We plug that back in, and then we get a rate expression that looks um, like, the, like what's drawn here. Hopefully nothing, too, uh, nothing here that you haven't seen before. So now we can consider three limit, uh, limiting scenarios, or two limiting scenarios, and then an intermediate scenario. So in the first case, K1, which we've defined as the initial 1-1 one, one migratory insertion in the forward step, and K2, the trapping, are fast compared to the reverse reaction. So we can think of that as L always traps. So every, at a molecular level, every time one molecule of the carbonyl complex undergoes one one migratory insertion, it's efficiently trapped by ligand. And thus the rate expression simplifies to Simply the the rate um, the the initial migratory insertion step. Now the opposite extreme is where um, the initial migratory insertion um, is happening in equilibrium, but it's almost always going backwards. So let's say it's one one thousandth of the time it gets trapped. Then the, the overall reaction rate is governed essentially entirely in, in the second step. And so in that case, the rate law ends up being overall second order for both, there's a, both a ligand term and a substrate term. And then the third case is the intermediate case where nothing, nothing cancels out. So oh, this is not exciting, and thus it doesn't get a convenient, a memorable name associated with it. This we just call the nothing cancels out. And that means that we need to consider uh, both steps in thinking about the overall rate here. Part of the reason I want to go through this exercise is to give everyone a flavor for the complexity involved here. Here we're just talking about a single elementary step and we see the level of complexity that can underlie this step 
in, 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 in the mechanism and, and thus the rate. Then if we think about an overall catalytic cycle where this is just going to be one elementary step and you start to get a flavor for how difficult it is to do kinetics and what care needs to be done to do them properly in terms of unpacking a, a mechanism. Okay, let's look, take a look now at a specific example, which is problem of the day number one from the day six worksheet. So we can put these principles work for us. So consider the, this process shown here. So from the initial ACL pentacarbonyl manganese species, now we incorporate an isotope label at the ACL carbon. This is gonna undergo some process to get to a new intermediate, oh, oops. I gave the, so this will undergo uh, a process to, to, to generate a new intermediate that's, that's not shown and then give us two possible products, A or B. And then, um, so think through what's going on here and then be prepared to explain your reasoning. And this one I think should be fairly straightforward. So I just give you 30 seconds to think about it. Okay, what do we think here, Annabelle? Okay. Which one? So we have, yeah, that's a good way to describe it. We have, as Annabelle pointed out, four equivalent COs and one inequivalent CO. So losing any of these is equivalent any of the four equivalent ones fine okay and then what will happen next well is the reverse of the migratory insertion okay so right now a retro one one migratory insertion to give a or b Any questions on that? First step be explained by Sisyphus. Why are we not losing this? Yeah, that's a good question. So what do you think would happen if you lose the trans C out of that? There will be no empty coordinating site that's next to I think that that's a important point is that if you're not sure, 
you can just run that ex that thought experiment and say, okay, let's lose the translate instead. What what's going to happen? There's nothing else in solution. If we free up a coordination site, the most likely thing that will happen is CO will reassociate and the overall process mm -hmm. will degenerate. So I think there's no productive thing that down that drill. But if you wanted to think about the kinetics of loss of cis CO, loss of the trans CO, it's, it's true that you could consider the cis effect. Yeah, thanks for that question, Ricky. So let's talk. So that um, I think is the nice segue into this the microscopic reverse of one one migratory insertion. Um, so we can go back up and if you want, you can label this alpha elimination. And so there are two forms of insertion, one one and one two, and there are two forms of elimination, alpha and so if you'd like, you could just call this retro one one migratory insertion. And so we see this commonly in, in metal acyls. That was the that was the example we just we just looked at. And this transformation, uh, this organometallic transformation, has also been applied in uh, can be applied in synthesis. So so let's consider this case. We've seen before Wilkinson's catalyst in this uh, class. So let's consider what happens when we re let Wilkinson's catalyst react here with acid aldehyde. I've, I've set this up by, by giving you a hint that the first step is going to be dissociation of triphenylphosphine to give an open coordination site. And what is going to happen next here, Elin? Sorry, could you? I think you had it right, but I, I just couldn't quite hear what you said. So, the hydrogen, the aluminum carbon, and uh, and substantially to the um, okay, I think I think you got it. So, you were saying some reaction between the H and the acyl and the metal, right? So in an initial step that I won't draw here, just in the interest of time, will be formation of the encounter complex. And then the next step will be, I think you may have heard you say, the cleavage of this CH bond. So this will give us a new acyl. This is a similar looking example to one we covered before, where now the phosphines, um, perf uh, uh, phosphines are preferring to uh, not be, um, uh, but the chlorine is is uh, is, is preferring to to um, be at the uh, axial position for chloride. Okay, and then. Uh, what do we have next here? Applying what we just what we just covered. Okay, alpha elimination next. Now the the new the newly formed CO and methyl need to be cisoid to one another. So that I uh, built in here. And then last, Elin, what, what do you expect might happen? Or what is the product? Methyl and what? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's also interesting that that's, you're not on the wrong track to think that methyl could potentially also spit out um, 
carbon, uh, the, the methyl chloride here. But in that case, I would expect it might just undergo rapid reoxidative addition to get to ultimately what's going to be the thermodynamic driving force, which is loss of methane. And this is actually a name name reaction. I don't know if anybody would recognize this. Feel free to shout out if you do recognize it. Beautiful CG. Now, Elin, would you expect this process to be catalytic or stoichiometric? And why? Okay. Any takers on this? So you have this, this question of how you would to turn over the catalytic cycle, you need to lose a CO ligand and gain a triphenylphosphine ligand back. But now you're at rhodium one carbonyl. That's a pretty strong interaction. So you've reached effectively a thermodynamic sink. You would need to find a way to pump more potential energy into this to get this to turn over. One possibility would be run at an elevated temperature so that you're driving CO off constantly to run the, to drive the reaction forward. So this has been rendered indeed catalytic, but in its initial manifestation, and still actually quite commonly used in synthesis, it would be used stoichiometrically. Okay, now let's consider a related process, which will bring us to problem of the day number two. And, and this is alpha elimination that are carbene generated. So let's go to problem of the day. I'll quickly share that. See ya. So consider this alkyl uh, tantalum olefin complex. And it might be helpful to quickly do our electron inventory on this. Um, so this is an equilibrium with another automeric form, C. So predict the structure of C and then propose a mechanism by which you would form it. Again, I think this one should be pretty quick. So, so jot down your thoughts and then discuss it with all the team. Okay, what do we think here, Jenny? Oxy addition to what? To, the, uh, to one of the methyls. Oh, okay. Oh, I, I mean, 
That is an interesting possibility. So you would oxidably add to one of the methyls, you would make a metallocyclobutane tantalum hydride. But that will be somewhat strained. So that might not be the preferred process that would happen. Let me, let's apply this recipe from directly above here, and I'll draw this in a suggestive way. Hydride added to the methyl. Aha, okay. So the hydride at the alpha position is going to do what? We'll go to the metal, I think you said. And then you'll form a new antelum carbon double bond. We'll cover this in the next lecture. This is carbon based. And then give me one more step here. Now you have a hydride tethered to an olefin. Beautiful. End product is what? Ethyl tantalum alkylate. And that process, as the problem states, is reversible. Let me set this up here with uh, this next part with uh, uh, pointing out the electron inventory here. So, can you help me with this, Jenny? What do we have here? Tantalum is what oxidation state? Three plus. E what? and then overall what? Okay, and then this intermediate, I would just help you with because we haven't learned how to count this type of carbene. As a preview, we'll say this is a Schrock type carbon. So we count this C metal double bond. In this particular case, don't, don't overly generalize this as two X type ligands. So it ends up being B0. Or electron count is what? So now let's compare this to a related example, and this is where we'll But this is okay because I used to have this in the carbene notes. So we're getting, getting behind to get ahead. So we treat this tri neopental tantalum dichloride with two equivalents of. Neopental lithium. And this will segue into the last batch of the notes, the transmetallation event, to make a 
per neopental, per meaning full substitution, per neopental tantalum. Transmetallation is redox neutral, so we go in with tantalum five, we still have tantalum five. Now let's do a quick electron inventory on this tantalum species. We're tantalum five. I said that. So we're what? D zero. Okay, so if we applied then the same logic as before, then what would happen? Let's just do that thought experiment. We would have an alpha elimination. Generate an intermediate that looks like this. And I think I've drawn this out before. Maybe this is the finish line. Then, reductive elimination of one of the hydride ligand and one neopental ligand to make neopentane to get here. But look at this intermediate. Does this make anybody uncomfortable? I'll draw it in red. Antalum seven plus D minus two. I think the overall electron count is not that bad, I guess. Even though on the surface, these processes look similar, this is different because at the state of the per neopental tantalum that you get to, this is D0. And so D0 metals will not undergo this alpha elimination because alpha elimination you can think of as being kind of like an intra, so Jenny was saying in, uh, an oxidative addition. Indeed, this is like an intramolecular oxidative addition. If you wanna push arrows, you can push arrows off of the off of the metal to the H, you need D electrons to do that. So what happens instead is more simple, is that you get direct reductive elimination, oh, sorry, direct elimination, not reductive elimination, direct elimination of one of the alpha H atoms and one of the alkyl groups to get neopentane. And does anyone know the name of this process? I hear someone whispering it. Is that you, Shang Huang? So this elementary step is called sigma bond metathesis. It's a type of CH cleavage. And one of the important things is that it happens at D0 metals. So you might hear it misapplied in the literature to non-D0. Actually, there are some cases I think where it's a fitting description for non-D0, but it, in the initial definition, it should be D0. And so that is a primer for both the metal carbene lecture as well as the CH activation lecture, because as it turns out, this is somewhat generalizable. D0 metal alkyls can engage in CH bond breaking through this sigma bond metathesis pathway. Okay, good. So that sets us up to wrap, wrap up this um, briefly. Um, chunk of notes um, next week, and then we'll jump into metal carbon multiple bonded species. Uh, keep plugging away.
any reminders from the TA? Okay, we're good to go. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend.